Hi, I'm Kimberly Malloy. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, but I call myself a motive therapist. So today we're gonna to talk about shame. Uh, we're gonna take a look at a story in the Bible, and we're also gonna take a look at how we fight shame ourselves. So just the word shame itself can sometimes cause a physical reaction in people, especially if we've been experiencing any kind of shame or we've had it in our past or maybe we're walking through it every day. Shame is one of those words that triggers things inside of us. So what is shame? I kind of define it as an overwhelmingly painful feeling that you are too broken, too, too unworthy, and too inadequate to deserve something or someone. Shame may sound like, I won't get that job. Shame could sound like, I can't have a healthy relationship, I'm just gonna screw it up. I can't pursue what God has for me because of my mistakes in the past. In the dark, shame grows, it multiplies, it invades our thoughts, and it impacts our actions. But in the light, it diminishes. I believe healthy guilt keeps us from repeating the same mistakes. The guilt can lead us to repentance, but shame can trigger almost a paralysis in us where we tell ourselves that we're too broken to do anything different, and it leads us away from who God says that we are. Guilt is, I wish I would have studied more for that test. Shame is, I'm so stupid, it doesn't matter how long I study, I'm gonna fail it. I think it's helpful for to us to understand who and how we formed our ideas around shame so we can reevaluate the story that we tell ourselves. So what were your childhood experiences around shame? Did you hear about your possibilities or your limitations? Did you, were you told to work hard and you can achieve your goals? Or were you told, don't bother, you're not gonna amount to anything? Did you hear, I love how you express your ideas in your art? Or did you hear, that's the ugliest thing I've ever heard? How about your school experiences? Did your teachers say, good job, keep trying? Or did you hear, just give up, you won't be able to finish this? In your relationships, do you hear, thank you for how hard you work? Or do you hear, is that all you have done? What about society? Ha, society, what do we do with shame? We go, oh, wow, you did that? Oh, I feel so sorry for you. There's something wrong. You must have done something wrong. We even tell people they don't belong because they don't fit in. I want to take a look now at how we react to shame. I want to look at the story in 2 Kings chapter 5. This chapter is one of my favorites. It's a story about vulnerability, fear, pride, anger. It's a story about a growing in character and circling back. I'm gonna give you the Kim version and I wanna tell you right now, please do not mistake my, my storytelling with biblical commentary because I am not a Bible scholar. But I'm gonna, I want you to look at um, starting the scripture, uh, verse five. It says, now Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Do you hear that? He was a great man, highly regarded, a valiant soldier. But, how many times have you heard when you hear the word but in a sentence, to disregard the former and concentrate on the latter? But he had leprosy. The story says how a young captive girl from Israel served Naaman's wife. And she said to Naaman's wife, listen, if Naaman goes to the king in Samaria, there's a prophet there and he can be healed of his leprosy. So Naaman went to his king to get permission to go to Samaria. He goes to Samaria, he gives the, the message to the king. And what does the king do? The king tears his clothes and maybe he yells at Naaman and says, what are you setting me up for? I can't cure leprosy. 
And I wonder if Naaman was confused, if he was afraid, if maybe he was even irritated at the king's response. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message, why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with all of his horses and his chariots uh, up to the door of Elisha's house. But what happens? Elijah doesn't come out. He sends a messenger. And the messenger says, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. And then it says, but Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and wave his hand over me and over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. It says twice that he went off in a rage. Naaman had a brain response to what was told to him and who said it. He was angry, but we know that anger is a secondary emotion. So we have to dig a little bit deeper to see what's under the anger. He processes some of it out loud and says, I thought he would surely come out. Perhaps he is thinking, after all, I'm in a position of authority. Why wouldn't he come out? Perhaps his brain connects the feeling to an earlier memory of being rejected, of not being good enough. I'm not enough. I'm not a king. I have leprosy. Perhaps a shame storm has started in Naaman's head. I shouldn't have hoped for this healing. I'm not worthy of not only healing, I'm not even worthy of the prophet coming out and seeing me, hearing me, or touching me. Maybe his thought was rejection. Because remember, he was just in front of the king, and the king rejected him. Brene Brown, in her book, Daring Greatly, talks about her research on shame and the research from Linda Hartling. She describes three different shame responses, three different ways that we armor up and react when we're triggered by shame. The first is moving away. I disappear in my own life. I stop showing up. Perhaps maybe we stop emailing people, stop texting people. We might, res we might check out, we might begin to numb. We hide, we isolate, we ignore. The second way that we can react to shame is moving towards. Now this looks like perfection. And what this looks like is you are thinking that the person who said something to you is right. And you begin to start playing it in your mind about how not perfect you are. You work twice as hard, perhaps maybe even you you kiss up a little bit, you perform more, you apologize when you're not really sorry, or maybe you don't even hold people accountable because you're fearful that they will be mad. The third way is we move against, using aggression to fight shame. If I can tell you how wrong you are, I disconnect from the very thing, the, the important thing that you're trying to convey to me. I blame. I one up. I believe this example of what Naaman did is a classic example of moving against. I hope that makes sense to you. We can use different shields for different people and different situations. We probably have one that we're more comfortable with, but I think we're capable of using all three of those ways to armor up in shame. What I love about the story of Naaman is that he allows his soldiers to speak truth to him. And he circles back to the prophet and he takes accountability and responsibility. So the truth is, is we're all imperfect. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Shame keeps us carrying sins and not releasing it. I want to take a moment now to introduce you to Russ. And Russ is not a, a character in the Bible. Russ is my acronym for fighting shame. So the R in Russ stands for recognize your shame shields. 
or recognize your shame triggers. Recognize when you are triggered by somebody. You may recognize it uh, in your stomach first or maybe in your head or maybe um, in your feet or your legs. Recognize when you feel it emotionally and where you feel it physiologically. The you in Russ is understand how shame works. How does your shame cycle work? What do you tend to do? Do you tend to move towards, against, away from? The first S in Russ is share your story. Don't isolate, but when someone has earned the privilege of hearing your story, share it with them. Don't let the pain be in vain. And the last S is speak shame out in the light. Shame cannot grow if it's in the light. Have somebody in your life that you can express how you feel and they can help you process and pray and proclaim your desires. Shame happens in community and it will be healed in community. Don't let shame keep you from what God has for you.